Excellencies, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased today to welcome you to this high-level panel of humanitarian affairs segment of Economic and Social Council on combating and preventing sexual gender-based violence in humanitarian crisis. I would like to welcome our distinct panelists from member states, humanitarian organizations, and civil society who will speak to key issues and provide experiences and promising practices to address sexual and gender-based violence. Humanitarian crises have different impacts on women, girls, boys, and men. Existing inequalities may be further exacerbated during and after crisis, disproportionately affecting women and girls, including exposure to gender-based violence, including sexual violence. In humanitarian crisis, we see all types of sexual and gender-based, especially when family and community protection mechanisms have broken down. The high-level panel is therefore an opportunity to highlight the disproportionate impact of emergency on women and girls and reinforce the importance of prioritizing their experiences, protection, capacity, and leadership, in particular their experiences of gender-based violence. This year, as we mark the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Green Platform for Action and the 20th anniversary of the Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace, and Security, it is highly important that we take stock of the work still ahead of us. The importance of high level, or this high level panel is only cemented with the global pandemic of COVID-19 that heightens pre-existing risk of gender-based violence against women and girls. High level events places gender equality at the heart of our work, and I am pleased to join the panelists and everyone participating from around the world today as we spend the next one and a half hours to hear about key issues and experiences and promising practices to address sexual and gender-based violence. I welcome our moderator and the Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and and emergency relief, my good friend, Mark Loco, and I invite him to conduct the panel discussion. I look forward to a productive exchange of views, but before giving the floor to Mark, I would like to welcome Her Excellency, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Norway. Welcome, we are very pleased to have you with us. It's a, a great signal of the commitment of Norway in this very important, and very sensitive issue I, and uh, personally, I still keep good souvenir of the uh, meetings you organized in your country a few months ago. Thank you very much and welcome. My dear Mark, Mike is yours. Well, Omar, thank you very much indeed, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much indeed for joining us uh, this afternoon. Um, we're delighted to be um, putting on this high-level panel on combating and preventing sexual and gender-based violence, and I'm enormously privileged to be your moderator um, today. Um, so let me um, introduce the panel. As Omar said, we're uh, very uh, grateful to have with us um, um, Ina eriksson Sereda, Norway's Foreign Affairs Minister, who is such a champion of women's and girls' empowerment and a tireless advocate against sexual and gender-based violence. We have renowned author and activist, uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, who's written powerfully about the experiences of women and girls in her books, including We Should All Be Feminists. We're also joined by Eleanor Rakes, Vice President and Head of Program Delivery at the International Rescue Committee, by Christine Season, the Sexual Violence Operations Manager from the International Committee of the Red Cross in South Sudan, and by Fatima Shehu Imam, the founder and executive director of the Rehabilitation, Empowerment and Better Health Initiative in Nigeria. And all of them are working daily 
from operational and policy perspectives to prevent sexual and gender-based violence. I want also to welcome my UN colleagues, Natalia Karnan, the Executive Director of the UN Population Fund, Henrietta Four, Executive Director of UNICEF, and Kelly Clements, the Deputy High Commissioner for Refugees. This is a time of great challenge. COVID-19 has upended every sphere of our lives. The virus has multiplied threats to human rights and dignity. It's forced us to take a hard and I hope honest look at inequalities and how we protect our most vulnerable. COVID-19 threatens to reverse the progress we've made in advancing gender equality and women's rights. Many women and girls have faced gender-based violence, including sexual violence and sexual exploitation and abuse. And in many places, calls to hotlines have increased by 30, 40 percent or more since quarantine and lockdown measures were put in place. But this is also a moment of opportunity, an opportunity to act fast and in unity while there is global momentum to recover better from the pandemic. So we have to pull together to put girls and women at the center of our efforts through a whole system approach working with local communities, civil society, governments, regional organizations, donors, humanitarian and development organizations, not just the specialists responsible for work on gender-based violence and responders, but everybody. Leaders in particular have to engage with service providers, gathering information and data on needs and priorities from community-based groups and women's groups. There are set of reasons why we need to prioritize this at the moment. It's not just that one in three women will experience some form of physical or sexual violence in their lifetime, and that that will be probably worse if the woman has a disability, but, be, but because what we're seeing is some of the ways in which COVID-19 is playing out is exacerbating gender-based violence. So we have to prioritize and fund services for survivors of all forms of gender-based violence, and we have to promote the leadership of meaningful participation of women in decision-making, including in leadership levels in the humanitarian community. Above all, we have to address gender inequality, which is the underpinning driver of so many of the, the problems we're having to address. My office, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, is trying to play its part, responding to and preventing gender-based violence in humanitarian emergencies. We were very pleased last year in May to co-host with the Government of Norway and others the Oslo Conference on Ending Sexual and Gender-Based Violence. We are, with, with our Norwegian co-host, tracking progress made by member states and organizations on hundreds of political policy and practical commitments and financial commitments to collectively strengthen accountability for addressing gender-based violence. People made promises in Oslo and we are tracking whether those promises are being kept and we hope to share the results at the General Assembly um, in September. We're also prioritizing gender equality and addressing gender-based violence in our response to the pandemic through the Global Humanitarian Response Plan, the Secretary General launched for COVID-19. And we're doing this because responding to gender-based violence reduces suffering and save lives. So let's hear now from our panel. I'm delighted to start with um, Ina eriksson Sereda um, from Oslo. As we've said, she's a staunch advocate on the issues of gender equality and sexual and gender-based violence. Um, Ina, can you tell us further to the Oslo conference how you think humanitarian organizations and member states need to further support mitigation, response, and prevention of GBV in the current circumstances. You have the floor. Well, thank you very much, Mark. And thank you also for this wonderful opportunity to engage with you on a topic that is, uh, as you said, Mark, very close to, to my heart. And you have been uh, vital yourself in actually making uh, possible many of the engagements that we've had. And you mentioned the Oslo conference, and I will get to that very shortly. Um, excellencies, colleagues, uh, dear friends, in many of the meetings I've had, first as a defense minister and now as a foreign minister, I've encountered stories about truly horrific uh, acts of sexual and gender-based violence. The systematic gang rape of girls and women, 
we have heard about boys and girls who have been maimed for life uh, of sexual violence. We have heard about men who have been sexually abused as child soldiers or detainees. We all know that sexual and gender-based violence is targeting civilians, tearing apart the very fabric of society, making sure families uh, are being uh, deprived of their dignity and they have traumas for, for years and for decades. And this is a real grave violation of human rights, of international humanitarian law. It can be uh, a war crime, it can constitute uh, a crime against humanity and also an act of genocide. And as we all know, impunity is unfortunately widespread. So we must ensure that the fight against sexual and gender-based violence remains high on the humanitarian agenda. And that's why I again want to thank Mark and thank Ocha for uh, convening not only this meeting, but, but being such a staunch supporter of this agenda. And I also want to thank my friend Omar for uh, the very nice introduction and also for convening this meeting. Morocco is a true friend and partner um, in this. Just over a year ago, as Mark mentioned, we had a conference uh, in Oslo, the first ever thematic conference on ending sexual and gender-based violence in humanitarian crisis. And I'm very proud of what we achieved there together with our co-hosts. We were co-hosting with Iraq, Somalia, the United Arab Emirates, and with uh, OCHA, UNFPA, and the ICRC. And we had more than 1,000 participants, and many of whom were representing local organizations, civil society. And I think, to be very honest, that the conference itself was a very important it was a milestone in actually bringing all of these actors together. As far as I know, this was also the first time ever that the UN and the ICRC had collaborated on a conference like this. Uh, we would like to do more of that because we see that it has an effect. We have made more progress since then, and Mark mentioned we are now tracking all the commitments that we <laughs> that we uh, got in. And it is actually uh, very interesting to see how it mobilized both financial but also political support for putting this high on the agenda. And I would now like to make um, three points about how I believe we can, uh, can move this forward and also looking at uh, the outcomes of, of last year's conference. First, we have to address the challenges that are now posed by the COVID-19. Restriction of movement, curfews, um, women being trapped at home with their abusers, limited access to essential health care, and all these factors are giving rise to serious concerns. And I'm sure that uh, Natalia will say something about this later on, but UNFPA has pointed out that progress towards ending sexual and gender-based violence will probably hit, be hit by a huge backlash uh, in the months to come. Reaching the targets by 2030 is now likely to slow down dramatically. And what the UNFPA sees now is that an additional 15 million SGBV cases are expected every three months uh, that the lockdown continues. That's a dramatic figure. Uh, and it is actually just adding on top of all of the other challenges that we see uh, from this crisis. I would really like to commend Ocha and Mark for um, coordinating COVID-19 Global Humanitarian Response Plan. We have already uh, earmarked funding for the activities of the UNFPA under this <clears throat> response plan. Second, we have to maintain the momentum that we uh, saw from um, the Oslo conference, but also continue to making this a priority in our humanitarian policies. We got more than $360 million in commitments financially during the conference. We are now also tracking several hundred commitments on policies, normative issues, response services, leadership, coordination, all of it. And we are now delivering on our commitments. We have uh, now allocated around uh, 350 million uh, Norwegian kroner a year to the SGBV fight. We promised a billion, uh, million, a billion Norwegian uh, kroner over three years, and we are very well on track to delivering that. But we also follow up on the political commitments. And uh, as you may know, last Friday, we were very proud to launch, together with the UN, 
our very brand new handbook uh, that is supposed to be used for UN field missions in how to prevent and to combat conflict-related sexual violence. This was an initiative from Norway a couple of years ago, been working very closely with the UN, and now the result is here. My third point is that we have to put the survivors at the center of our response and our approach. We have to also recognize that women and girls are also very powerful agents of change, not only in their own lives and communities, but they are also key actors in the humanitarian response. This was also one of our main messages in Oslo, and the fact that we were able to put together civil society, governments, organizations, everyone who has something to contribute in this fight was actually vital. We can achieve better results if we are working together. And a call to action on protection of gender-based violence in emergencies is also a very important part of this context. Just let me end by saying, dear colleagues, dear friends, uh, that addressing SGBV has to be a priority in all our humanitarian responses. We issued a new action plan on our humanitarian strategy um, a year and a half ago. And this was at the very center and the very core of this plan. Protecting people at risk and providing assistance to survivors must be at the core of both the humanitarian response, but also the long-term response. And again, thank you so much for convening this. And I'm looking very much forward to hearing the rest of the panelists. Thank you very much, Mark. Now, Alina, thank you very much indeed. I'm going to go next to uh, my colleague and good friend, Natalia Karnan, the executive director of UNFPA, who's very well known not only for her work at the UN Population Fund, but also with the private sector on youth issues, including right back to the 1990s with the Ford um, Foundation. Um, Natalia, Ina teed you up just there to talk a bit about what more must be done to advance gender equality and the empowerment uh, of women and girls in um, humanitarian settings and transforming norms and systems that perpetuate gender inequality. Um, what is your message to us today, please? Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much, uh, uh, everyone, excellencies, distinguished delegates, and Minister Ina. We do meet at an unprecedented time. COVID-19 is exposing the stark inequalities and injustice in the world. And what I would like to add to the discussion is precisely what was just put on the table by Ina, the need for survivor-centered services and gender justice. And what better time than now? We're commemorating a year since Oslo that was quite an impressive rallying of the international community. Now, 25 years after Beijing and 20 years since Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security, we are witnessing this pandemic and we see the surge in violence against women and girls. In Iraq, a rapid assessment exercise on gender-based violence conducted by UNFPA and a coordinated group of civil society partners, very important, showed us that domestic violence there accounts for 94% of the reported incidents of gender-based violence during this time of COVID. And 40% of health service providers indicated an increase in the number of women who were coming to seek assistance. In just two months, Heartbreakingly, 123 suicide attempts resulting from gender-based violence. And that's just one example, very telling among many. And the only response is stop. This has to stop. In every home, in every community, in every refugee camp, in every country, it must stop. Now, UNFPA has kept our focus on getting to zero gender-based violence in all its forms by the year 2030, as the Sustainable Development Goals demand. Zero gender-based violence, including harmful practices such as gender-based violence and the harmful practice of child marriage. And to get to zero, we need to make zero tolerance a reality. 
UNFPA took urgent action, always in concert with our partners in Bangladesh, for example, to provide an integrated sexual and reproductive health service capacity. Very important part of that is mental health, psychosocial support. We strengthen the capacity of health workers to adapt the referral pathways so that women walk in, they can get the services that they need. In Sudan, the Ministry of Social Affairs there set up the first ever gender-based violence hotline. Now, through our leadership in this cluster area, the GBV area of responsibility, we've tried to provide guidance and more guidance is required to promote the shared learning between countries. How do we manage cases? How do we adapt these services so we can respond in real time during the pandemic? Much more has to be done because we are witnessing horrifying atrocities. Sexual and intimate partner violence, forced early and child marriage going up, sexual enslavement, forced pregnancy, human trafficking. It's all part of a piece, and it's a health risk that has profound traumatic outcomes. Mental health, yes. Adverse reproductive outcomes, yes. Poor sexual health, disability, and death, and sometimes passed on trauma to the next coming generations. So this is a global emergency. It's something that is very worthy of our full commitment, collaboration, and mobilization. Women and girls cannot wait. And globally, as we know, more than 240 million women and girls between the ages of 15 and 49 suffer physical or sexual violence at the hands of an intimate partner every single year. 35% of women have experienced either physical or sexual intimate partner violence or sexual violence by a non-partner, 35%. And some women experience both. Unacceptable. Our recent study uh, joined, in which we joined UN Women, which was based on data from Bangladesh, Nigeria, and Somalia, found just recently that 39% of the humanitarian ask for women and girls was covered. This is in contrast to 69% of the overall. And the consequences of this have been devastating. This is why we're appreciative of this moment with ECOSOC to call attention to the need for increased investment in these services because they are life-saving. Prevention first, and of course, the response to gender-based violence. And we're also talking about changing harmful social norms. That means working with communities. It means working with women, but also with men, with girls and boys, and supporting local leadership, especially local women's organization who can help to design and deliver the response. So in closing, I'd like to say, let us heed the United Nations Secretary General's call to place the safety of women and girls at the center of all COVID-19 appeals and response plans, and let us designate life-saving, gender-based violence services as essential, because they are. Now, as we stand together for the rights and the safety and dignity of women and girls everywhere, we must take action every day for gender equality and justice, for the peace that we need in our hearts, in our homes, in our communities, and in this world. Thank you so much, Mark and colleagues, for the opportunity. Well, Natalia, thank you so much. It's a huge honor now to be able to introduce Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. Um, you all know her books, I'm sure, Half of Yellow Sun, Americana. I mentioned earlier, we should all be feminists. You've often written and spoken about the importance of having multiple narratives and recognizing that. I mean, especially the importance of prioritizing women and girls' experiences and stories. Um, so can you please share with us now some of your thoughts on this topic? You have the floor. Please go ahead. I'm so sorry. So we're not hearing you, but I, I understand you're online. Could you just try if you have a mute button on your Computer, could you just try pressing that? Okay. Can you hear me now? 
We can. Thank yes. you. Please go ahead. Um, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lucock. Thank you. Thank you to everyone there, all the panelists. Um, it's it's uh, very nice to be here to have the chance to say a few words. Um, I remember when somebody said to me some years ago, why do you call yourself a feminist? Why don't you just say that you're a humanist? Um, and I said, calling myself a feminist, of course, doesn't mean that I don't realize that um, everyone in the world has suffered, you know, men have suffered. But I think it's it's my recognition that women and girls have historically been excluded, diminished, um, oppressed. And to call myself a feminist is to say that we need to do better collectively. And so I want to talk about two young women today. The first one, her name is Owa Vera. Her name was Owa Vera Omozua. She was 22 years old. She was a student at the University of Benin in Nigeria. She was raped and murdered just two weeks ago. Um, another woman, actually a girl, not a woman, she was 12 years old. Her name was Farishna. She was from Jigawa State in Nigeria. She was raped by 11 men. Uh, um, and I, I want to stop talk by talking about them because I think it's important to talk about language. Um, what I've noticed in the reactions to these horrific rapes is that there's a language around, around rape and sexual assault of women that we really need to start to think about and talk about. What language do we give girls to talk about their bodies? What language do we give boys to talk about what girls and women represent in our societies. I think that there is an epidemic of male entitlement towards female bodies. It's a global epidemic and it's something that we need to address. When I was growing up, I don't think I, I had the language to talk about. Had I been the victim of sexual assault, I would not have known how to talk about it. The word for vagina in my language, Igbo, is loaded with shame. And if you're a good girl, you're not supposed to know that word. And so it matters how we, how we teach girls to talk about these things, because if they don't have the language, then they don't feel equipped to talk about what's happening to them. But it's not even just about the language. It's also about how it's also about how we as a society react to girls and women talking about assault. Um, and it's not just men. I think it's also important for, for all of us to acknowledge that it's men and women that seek to silence women and girls who talk about their experiences. We live in a culture that diminishes women. And so both men and women participate in that culture. There have been so many, um, really disappointing um, views from Nigerians asking questions like, what was the girl wearing when she was raped? Or what was she doing where she was? As though what she's wearing or what she was doing somehow justifies her having been raped. And so I think it's important for us to, to really start to question, interrogate, um, the language that we use, how we talk about these things, because how we talk about things really matters. We need to find ways to make talking about these things both ordinary and heroic. We need to, to say to, to young boys before they become men that they do not have any entitlement to women's bodies. And we need to tell girls before they become women that their bodies belong to them. And of course, it's all easy to say because it's, it's very complicated. But I think even interrogating the ways in which we use culture, that word culture, the ways in which we use culture to evade
is very encouraging. It's really important that we listen to women. Um, women like women like um, women like there's a woman on the panel who's done such a woman like Fatima Shehu Imam, who's whose work I've been following, who's done such such important work with the civil society in northern Nigeria. Women like her, but also just women on the ground. We need to start to hear women, to listen to women. And I just want to end with a, a little story about um, a friend of mine who's, um, you know, who's who's a good man, who's European, who who's liberal, who believes in equality. And he was talking to me about having bought Michelle Obama's book, Becoming. And he said, I bought many copies and I'm going to give them to all my female friends. And I remember saying to him, well, why all your female friends? And he was a bit taken aback. But what that showed me is this, I think, very stubborn idea that somehow women's stories are for women alone. I think we need to change that. I think we need to make women's stories universal stories. Men need to hear women's stories. And maybe, maybe if we have more men hearing women's stories, maybe we can start getting ahead in that idea that men are not entitled to women's bodies. I'll end here and I'll thank, thank you very much for um, having me. Well, thank you very much indeed for such a powerful and moving contribution. I should perhaps confess that my daughter bought Michelle Obama's book for me. <laughs> I don't know what that's a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but thank you so much. It was a really powerful contribution. We really appreciate your um, joining us today. And I'm thrilled now actually to. Um, introduce somebody you referred to, um, Fatima Shehu Imam, who's the founder and executive director of the Rehabilitation Empowerment and Better Health Initiative in Nigeria. Originally, we were we were going to hear from Fatima a bit later on, but I think it would be great to hear from you now, Fatima, if you could, um, building on the contribution we've just had, tell us a bit about um, your experience since the Oslo conference, because you were there with us that day. And you have really, I think, important insights into the important role of civil society, in particular women leaders in civil society, um, and the contribution that you can make, especially in communicating um, to men. So please, you have the floor, over to you. Um, thank you very much, um, Mr. Moderator, my fellow panelists, um, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I would like to start by sharing a personal experience. As a women leader and also part of the civil society in Northeastern Nigeria, I have had the opportunity of engaging with uh, humanitarian and development actors at different levels, at the regional as well as at international level, from Nairobi to Oslo to Geneva to New York. And every time, I am so excited and enthusiastic to actually impute, to contribute, and, and to advocate for change. My participation has always raised expectations in the minds of civil society generally, but particularly in the minds of women, vulnerable women and girls. During those engagements, a lot of promises are made a lot of commitments are made. However, what is lacking is the political will to implement this community, these commitments. And every time these women always wish it will not be business as usual. And that explains the, the frustrations, the disappointment, as well as the impatience from these acutely vulnerable women and girls. Here I am once again, taking seats are still there. Good forces are still there. The systemic problems are still there. In fact, only getting to be there. COVID-19, for example, has only accentuated and further exacerbated the already existing challenges that we face regarding sexual and gender-based violence. Issues in Northeastern Nigeria, for 
example. Women and girls are the face of the crisis because they account to more than 80% of the affected population. However, their voice and agency remain silent and marginalized because of pre-existing gender inequalities. The, that has led to lack of meaningful participation of the women and girls. The space continue to shrink, either because of male dominance or patriarchy, or like I said in the beginning, because of pre-existing gender inequality issues, these women do not have the space to actually make decisions about matters that affect them and their children. Most often, women and girls, capacity is undermined. Their abilities is not recognized. Their voices is not amplified. They are not visible at all. And because mainly women-led organizations are at grassroots level, Issues of capacity are thrown at them. Issues of conforming to one policy or to another system. But I think what we need to recognize is the fact that international systems and policies that are rigid need to change and not the other way around. So if we are going to talk about challenges that really affect women-led organizations, it has to do with issues of preference and prioritization by donors of international actors for funding. We all know that funds is very important and essential to ensure that the desired impact is achieved. There is the need for women-led organizations to be given that opportunity to do what they know how to do best. These are women that are mainly first responders that do what they're, supposed, what they're doing even without support. So we need the support and encourage them. And also, there is the need to encourage equal partnership. Most often what we see is this unequal partnership that exists between the international actors and the local actors. That is highly detrimental to the women-led organizations. That brings me to the second part of your question, Mr. Moderator. How do we do it? First and foremost, we need to encourage women's participation. And by participation, we're referring to meaningful participation, not just to tick the box or just to be at the table, but we have to be on the table in numbers so that our voices would be heard and so that collectively we can be able to make the desired change. We can be able to collectively advocate for issues that affect us in the ways that only us can be able to say it, and only us do know it. Secondly, there is the need to really bring decision-making closer to the grassroots by taking power closer to the grassroots and taking it away from the international actors. By also changing the system of male dominance to a system where women play a very central role. And I think I need to be very, very clear here. We're not looking for a situation that we're going to create competitiveness or unhealthy rivalry between women and men. We're looking for a situation where we will collaborate and complement each other to tackle the problems of GBV that is affecting all of humanity. It is also very important for us to understand that as international actors, we should not be seen to be reinforcing discriminatory social norms. We're supposed to take advantage of opportunities that just exist within the humanitarian and development context to recognize it and then to help in changing those power imbalances that does exist and such discriminatory social norms that is hindering women and women-led organizations' participation. It is also very important to recognize that whatever we want to do would have to put women and women-led organizations in the heart of our response. Often, we, we design programs with minimal consultations of women and women-led organizations during the planning stage, during design stage, we hardly consult them. And that results 
in lack of impact, most often the desired impact is not achieved. So we would like to see a situation where there is equal partnership between donors and local actors, and here specifically, I'm talking about women-led organizations, that is mutually beneficial. A kind of partnership that the local actors can be able to hold them accountable, where the voice and agency, local actors, especially women-led organizations, will be amplified and not their capacities undermined. So I am trying to say, in essence, that there is the need to translate all these commitments into action. We have been from one continent to the other, from one country to the other. We have done a lot of talking. And every time we come back, we come back to the same situation every time. There is the need to put in more action to those commitments to ensure that there is an accountability they ensure that those commitments can, those making the commitments can be held accountable to ensure that they are not just promises because we're talking about human lives. We're talking about lives and we're saying that every life matters. So thank you for this opportunity, Mr. Moderator and my fellow colleagues, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Henrietta, you also were with us in Oslo, uh, where UNICEF made some extremely bold and ambitious commitments on ending um, gender-based violence. Um, how have you found the experience over the last year in taking all of that forward? And what do you think the priorities for us all should be now? Uh, thank you very much, Mark. And thank you also to Omar, uh, it is very nice that both of you as men have assembled an all women's panel. So thank you very much uh, for caring about this issue deeply. We, we, we all really appreciate that. So um, may I chime in and add to my um, sister panelists that we are all deeply concerned about the increase of gender-based violence during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we know and we see every day that the color of your skin or the sex at your birth still determine life, death, and the probability of violence. It's especially true for women and girls, and they, they encounter unspeakable levels of violence, even worse now in times of crisis. We must remember that it's not unique. Gender-based violence increases at every humanitarian emergency. And Natalia and UNFPA have um, much good statistics around this. And I'm very pleased that Norway and the foreign minister, her leadership, Ina's leadership, has really led to bringing out many of these statistics. Uh, we must all stand together and the collective action is helpful. So if I may just give a, um, a stamp of approval to the call to action on protection from gender-based violence in emergencies. It was collaborative. It reflects Natalia's work that women and girls cannot wait. And uh, Chimimanda Ngozi Adichie's words about the brutality of raping 12-year-old girls and the urgency of eloquence in ordinary and heroic language so that we can change hearts and minds. But with that, Mark, let me turn to what happened in Oslo, because we did make some bold announcements and we were not sure if we could reach them, but um, I have some good news. So let me, uh, let me address the answer. In just one year, we made some significant progress and I will mention three areas. The first is we have increased coverage of gender-based violence programs quickly. In 2019, we reached 3.3 million women and children with these programs. It's more than three times the number that we reached in 2018. We could not have done this without our civil society and nonprofit partners. We also increased the number of countries in which we specifically addressed GBV in emergencies. 
So 71% of our UNICEF 2020 humanitarian appeals for children now included. And by 2021, it will be at 100%. Uh, we nearly doubled the number of countries reporting GBV work uh, as a part of the response to COVID-19. And we will extend this to all 130 countries in the next two months. So the good news here, Mark, is that what we had um, uh, responded to, committed to, was 50% of the hacks would include GBV by 2020, and we exceeded that. So we're thankful that we're moving. The second report is that we have adapted and expanded GBV response services to keep life-saving programs up and running. So let me give you three quick examples on adapting and one on expanding. In adapting, at the country level, together with partners, including local women's organizations, we've made strategic shifts to minimize the interruption of services for gender-based violence over the last few months, so that in Lebanon and in Somalia, we've scaled up remote service provision through helplines and hotlines, providing mental health and psychosocial support that women and girls trust. <clears throat> Pardon me. In Sudan and in refugee camps in Bangladesh, female volunteers conduct regular house visits to share information on how to prevent the spread of COVID-19. And they use these visits as an opportunity to raise awareness about GBV services in the community. And then a second example on adapting at the global level on case management. It is, this is fundamental to addressing the mental health consequences of GBV that Natalia mentioned. Uh, it is uh, becoming even more important because of COVID-19. These are policies in the area of GBV responsibility. And there's a help desk that UNICEF funds and manages with UNFPA across all contexts. It includes digital and low technology options. We also partnered with the International Rescue Committee to issue tips on how to adapt specialized programming for specialized for adolescent girls. And this has really been popular and it's important. And then thirdly on adapting, in Zimbabwe and Jordan, we have been advocating to ensure that GBV and child protection social workers continue to work through the issuance of special permits, providing hygiene kits, and protective gear in Jordan and um, for the Ministry of Justice to consider GBV cases in Zimbabwe. And in expanding the work, um, we have uh, focused on the humanitarian needs overviews and the response plans through the cluster clusters that we lead. Uh, we have led risk mitigation through the entire program focus. So um, let me now turn to um, our uh, third commitment, which is in line with the SG's call to put women and girls at the center of COVID-19 through funding appeals and response plans and innovative financing instruments and approaches. Um, we are now putting them in as blended public and private investments to end GBV, and we need to reimagine how financing can be done to address this issue. So two things I would close with. Uh, we want to reimagine a world where girls and women can live in this world without fear. So first, we must continue to increase coverage of GBV programs. It should be at the center of all of our humanitarian response plans and in the UN's framework for um, socioeconomic response to COVID-19. There are 124 countries who have answered the SG's calls, but we need to make sure that it covers all girls and all women. We must also make sure that it covers the social workers who are trained in GBV for humanitarian crisis. And second, we must ensure that the work is financed. So the foreign minister, Ine, mentioned about her finance and about the handbook, and this is all extremely important. But GBV must be valued as essential to recovery. So to help do this, today we are launching at UNICEF a due diligence tool 
that will help governments and investors understand how gender-based violence undermines investments that we're making. But if we tackle it and include it, it will increase overall development results. So thank you very much. UNICEF is proud to stand with you all today and to reimagine a world in which girls and women no longer live with fear. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Henrietta. Um, let me now turn to Kelly Clements, the Deputy High Commissioner for Refugees. Among the most vulnerable women and girls on the planet are those who are displaced, either refugees or displaced in their own country. And they're particularly vulnerable to sexual exploitation and abuse, which is an issue that um, Kelly champions. So, um, Kelly, please give us your perspective on this set of um, this set of issues we're trying to make progress on today. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. And I'm just delighted to be on this panel of uh, wonderful activists for this conversation. I have to congratulate you for putting together a, a, a great set of voices in terms of trying to raise up this this particular. Uh, topic which we agree needs more amplification and now is the moment. Uh, Norway certainly a year ago really lifted it to another place and to, to have this conversation and, and dovetailing it with a call to action, uh, we're delighted. We too agree that you know now is the time too to be looking very seriously, including at with issues related to forced displacement on systemic inequalities. We know that women and girls are at particular risk uh, and in those refugee and IDP communities, they can be uh, the most marginalized. So in terms of attention, and when we look at um, the, the impact of the current pandemic, uh, and you mentioned it, the minister has mentioned it, Fatima, uh, Fatima just mentioned it, uh, the need really to invest to, to address gender inequality, power imbalances, and structural discrimination at every level. And so what we see in the issues related to, to the forcibly displaced, we see an increased exposure to gender-based violence. And you heard that obviously from Natalia and from Henrietta in, in some of the areas that we're working in close collaboration with them and obviously a, a large number of partners dedicated to this issue. Because what we see is of course, in a situation where we are now, uh, in situations when we are trying to uh, prevent the spread of the infection, Home is often not the safest place to be, even if that home is temporary. Um, so we have to take particular care, especially when it comes to issues related to sexual explo exploitation and abuse, to um, make sure that we aren't seeing an increase in incidents. We know with economic impacts in particular, people losing their livelihoods, the uh, potential for survival sex um, with children out of school, these are areas where we have um, a, a potential of having fewer reporting options for those very people most at risk uh, in such a circumstance. Now, for, for us, for UNHCR, adapting some of the gender-based uh, violence programmings to address these urgent needs becomes critical. And some of these were mentioned earlier, particularly by Natalia. Issues related to remote case management, this becomes critical. How do we get increased emergency cash support? And we've seen the socioeconomic impacts um, for, for our portion of the Global Humanitarian Response Plan, 40% of that is to try to lift up the cash support that we have. This will go as a direct uh, complement to what we're trying to do to prevent uh, gender-based violence, sexual exploitation and abuse. Um, the referral mechanism related to GBV was mentioned. Information to communicate communities becomes important. We know that women and girls are bearing the disproportionate brunt of the crisis, uh, but we're also very inspired by the leadership of many refugee women's organizations that are stepping forward in terms of leadership and response. Uh, Fatima had mentioned this, of course, and we've seen this clearly, both in the Global Refugee Forum last year, but also now in terms of response to the pandemic and trying to make sure that we don't roll back some gains that we've made on prevention of, of GBV and sexual exploitation and abuse. Um, a couple of examples, if I might, Mark, um, to complement, although uh, Henrietta's list uh, was quite extensive in terms of what, what, she, what uh, UNICEF has carried forward, and she mentioned the strong collaboration among partners, and we want to recognize that as well. I think the call to action has been an important way to, to demonstrate that kind of partnership. Um, in Uganda, we have, have a, a very important helpline in 15 different languages related to referrals 
with tra trained protection staff and counselors that are available to be able to talk to those that are facing particular now, particularly in restricted environments that the, the pandemic is, is presenting uh, help. In Cameroon, we have uh, adapted programming related to remote case management with community volunteers, for example, to reach out. Um, several of our panelists talked about Bangladesh. We have a different tact where we have used a partnership with BRAC, obviously an important uh, local NGO on GBV prevention, for example, involving positive male role models. And again, the importance of having men as part of this conversation, fathers and brothers, uh, becomes critically important. Uh, and in Colombia, as a, as a last example, um, shelters for sur survivors in some of the border areas of the region, when, when now we see, particularly in the pandemic, so many more people losing livelihoods and losing their homes and, and places to, to, uh, to live. Now, in terms of the, 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 what we've seen practically with regard to response, um, you know, I think, Mark, in, in April, we launched as part of the championship um, a, a community outreach and communications fund for local NGOs. And again, we get to the, the issue of first responders being so critically important to preventing uh, sexual and gender-based violence. We had 1,200 applications from local NGOs for this fund from 70 different countries, which you can see the need for being able to provide yet more support to those first line responders to be able to address this. So no, we know that there are immediate needs now, there will be longer term impacts and the impact will be felt particularly on women and children. And we need to be ready as some other panelists have said to address the trauma and the effects of GBV, including during the current lockdown and the impact, of course, will be importantly, unfortunately, felt by women and children primarily. Thank you very much, Mark. Honored to be with our fellow panelists. Well, thank you very much, Kelly, for, um, for that and for all your championing um, of this agenda with Filippo as well, the High Commissioner for Refugees, who's been a terrific uh, champion in this um, area in the last, uh, over many years, actually, but especially in the last year when he's had the championship in particular. So we're now going to hear from um, Christine Sason, who's the um, Sexual Violence Operations Manager for the International Committee of the Red Cross in South Sudan. Christine, um, thanks for joining us. Now this work in protecting women and girls from gender-based violence um, can't be done, obviously, without the engagement and support of governments and local authorities. So how does ICRC work with them and with armed actors, um, for that matter, to build capacity and compliance with international humanitarian law, but also with basic norms and standards to protect women and girls? Um, please give us your thoughts. Thanks very much for the interesting question. And I also did want to thank the valuable insight that was shared earlier from Ms. Caroline Ogwam, the director of the South Sudan Women with Disabilities Network in an earlier panel. And also certainly the very interesting remarks shared by Ms. Adichie on the importance of language and approach, but also very much the, the very real and personal impact that sexual violence has. For the International Committee of the Red Cross, uh, the Sexual Violence Strategy and our Sexual Violence Special Appeal of 2020 commits the ICRC to addressing sexual violence globally, and particularly in 14 contexts of armed conflict, other situations of violence, and in places of detention for us to realize this priority. The ICRC has a clear role to play in addressing sexual violence as a violation of international humanitarian law and in relation to international human rights law and conflict, detention and other situations of violence, which are the settings in which we operate. And indeed, IHL provides us with a key entry point for our operational work on the issue. And I'd like to tell you a bit more about how we address sexual violence in operations and then focus in a bit on some of lessons for engagement with authorities. The sexual violence work of the ICRC is not new in our 150 year history. We've worked on sexual violence, especially through our health and protection programs for a great many years because it's an unfortunate and an unfortunately constant reality in the context in which we work. Violations of IHL remain our utmost concern. Because of this, the ICRC's institutional strategy on sexual violence highlights that the ICRC takes a reversed burden of proof approach related to our sexual violence work which means that the ICRC will assume that sexual violence takes place in locations where we work unless we prove otherwise. 
And this does not mean that the ICRC is not going to continue to be data and evidence-based in our approach, but rather that our starting point is a proactive one, acknowledging the unfortunately overwhelming prevalence of sexual violence. What we all also know is that sexual violence almost never occurs in a vacuum. It's often part of a continuum of violence exacerbated by other variables such as economic insecurity, displacement, physical insecurity, etc. The role of the ICRC sexual violence advisors, operational managers such as myself, are to take a multidisciplinary approach and support the different departments in ICRC operations in integrating sexual violence prevention and response concerns. It's also to work with MAP and understand risks and trends of the at-risk groups with whom we work. In South Sudan, where I work, the ICRC runs a community-based protection program placing the people we work for at the center of our operational planning and consideration. The community-based protection workshops in South Sudan brings together members of the community and ICRC staff in order to develop a greater understanding of their specific needs, vulnerabilities, and capacities, and to engage in a structured discussion with, amongst other groups, women and girls. These workshops focus on pulling out concrete outcomes and conclusions. And of course, we note that we work with men and boys, in particular due to the ICRC's global work on detention, whereby men and boys form the majority of detainees in a given place of detention. Additionally, our global team has recently conducted research on how to improve our operational response to men, boys, and gender minorities. As with all areas of our work, the ICRC acknowledges that we are one part of the larger humanitarian and nexus prevention and response mechanisms working on this topic. We do feel that the ICRC has a unique role to play in this field, given our level of access, breadth and reach to all beneficiaries and scope of dialogue and ability to engage authorities with weapon bearers in bilateral and confidential dialogue. Alongside the delivery of these multidisciplinary and human-centered response services, our engagement with governments and authorities at the national and local level is key aspect in our strategy. Indeed, sexual violence is prohibited under international humanitarian law, and we seek to prevent it by engagement with lawmakers to create a conducive and well-implemented legal environment for addressing it holistically, but also by addressing behaviors, for example, among weapon bearers. In dialogue with all types of authorities, we highlight that in armed conflict, rape and other forms of sexual violence are, are serious violations of international humanitarian law, and that all states have obligations to make them crimes under domestic law. We seek to address not just law, but increasingly tackle drivers of sexual violence, such as peer dynamics and armed forces. For example, last year we published guidelines on how to engage state armed forces on addressing sexual violence. And we use these tools in engaging armed forces in these discussions on how to prevent sexual violence, mitigate risks, and respond to it with governments who contribute support and troops, uh, contributing support and troops to the places in which we work and to the national authorities. Sexual violence response for the ICRC continues to be a priority, especially in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, precisely because this pandemic and its secondary measures are exacerbating risk. We are implementing risk mitigation, new communication such as adapted radio messages and working on cash-based guidance and delivery to address negative coping mechanisms from the crisis. The ICRC in South Sudan and in all locations where we work will continue to prioritize engagement across a broad spectrum of actors putting affected populations at the heart of our operations and engagement with authorities based on the rights and needs of the people that we serve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christine. And our last panelist is um, Eleanor Rakes, who's worked in uh, Chad and Afghanistan and Zimbabwe, and also on the Europe refugee crisis, and is currently the Vice President and Head of Programme Delivery at the International Rescue Committee. Now, the IRC has a strong focus on women's empowerment and engagement in decision making in humanitarian settings. Um, what perspective would you offer for today's uh, discussion, please? Thank you, Mark. And it's an honor to be here among this panel of fabulous, fearless women. Um, I also particularly appreciated hearing from Fatima um, as a representative of civil society in Nigeria. Um, because to answer your question, um, I want to start with the point that we uh, need to do better at creating space for women leadership voices that are 
from the countries and the communities where humanitarian programming is being delivered. Uh, it's so fundamental to this question of uh, decision making um, uh, and uh, effective delivery of programs that address uh, issues for women and girls in humanitarian contexts. Um, the International Rescue Committee has been and will continue to be deeply invested in partnering with local women's organizations, in particular women-led organizations, um, as core part of our response in humanitarian settings. We're actually on the cusp of finally finalizing our new global strategy and conversations about how we can do even better at, uh, as Fatima put it, truly equal partnerships and actually changing power imbalances both within our own organization and across the sec sector um, have been front and center um, to the, the development of, the, of our new global strategy. Um, Mark, you said at the very beginning of this panel um, that we need leaders from across the sector, uh, not only technical experts um, on this subject, I am not a technical expert on this subject. I oversee the International Rescue Committee's program delivery across all sectors in Africa, Asia, Middle East, and Latin America. Um, and this is a, uh, a core part of all of our work. Um, the second thing I would say, therefore, on that question is that the importance, to talk about the importance of a, a truly feminist approach to designing and delivering programs. Um, feminist approaches, we know, consider power and access um, uh, COVID has sharpened our attention um, on the need, just as one example, on the need to take, a, a, take into account the lack of digital act access uh, and literacy uh, among women and girls in many of the contexts that we work in. So all our work has to be informed by this lens uh, across all, all humanitarian settings, whether um, lens, uh, across all humanitarian settings, whether um, uh, working in a COVID context or otherwise. Um, what we've learned with COVID, um, as with other humanitarian crises, is that GBV services can and must continue, that they are life-saving, um, that they need to be adapted to the specific challenges that that emergency and crisis brings, and that we need to be listening to what the data tells us. So just a few examples from our protection monitoring work in the last few months uh, within the context of COVID. Um, this was mentioned earlier by my colleague from the UK. Uh, the IRC alone has received over 100 GBV-related suicide attempts or incident reports. Uh, we've had a 70% increase in call to the GBV hotline uh, reported to our local partner in El Salvador. And at the same time, when we analyze the case management data, we see reporting falling uh, in some contexts due to the inability to access services, uh, including the technology-based services such as hotlines that have been put in place. We've seen this in Tanzania, we've seen this in Bangladesh. In Iraq, uh, the IRC received no reports of gender-based Iraq violence for nearly two months before awareness raising for the hotline was able to be increased and women became more aware of ways to report. Following that effort, 65% of service provision points reported an increase or exacerbation in one or more types of GBV. We know, as has been said by my fellow panelists, we know that these issues uh, are exacerbated by any crisis, and that is absolutely the case with COVID. Um, we have to get good data, and we have to be adaptive in how we deliver programs to make sure that we can maintain and continue services um, to these uh, two vulnerable populations. I would be remiss not to mention um, that violence against, women, against children is also increasing. Um, and it's important, I think, to remember that children in the context of COVID have few, if any, opportunities to report uh, without mandated reporters, um, such as teachers, uh, because of um, widespread school closures. So that's an, an also an issue of, of huge concern. Throughout COVID, we've been continuing to provide case management services in 28 countries. Um, we've been uh, uh, adapting our programs um, with hygiene protocols, physical distancing, increased attention to hotlines, other, other digital means of providing continued services, including case management. Um, adaptations have to be thoughtful, they have to be thorough, and they have to be creative, and they have to be um, relevant to the specific context. We're prioritizing case management and psychosocial support, clinical care for sexual assault survivors, kit distributions, risk communication and information sharing through women led networks. My colleagues have already mentioned, um, but I want to underscore the importance of funding in this area. Um, we know that it was already before COVID uh, insufficient, um, and it, it continues to be the case. Um, when we looked at the global uh, HRP, um, the GBV request uh, amounts to just 45 million US dollars, which is just 0.676% of the overall request of $6.64 billion for COVID response. 
Tracking also has to be better so that we can know what is being spent where and what the gaps therefore continue to be. That's still something that we see uh, needs more work and attention um, in addition to increasing um, the absolute amounts of funding. Um, and we just we, we continue to call for the rhetoric of DVD programming being life-saving, which we've seen great get much better attention in recent years, but it has to be put and translated into action. We have to see governments putting out calls for, for proposals for gender-based violence specifically, uh, directly to NGOs, particularly to local NGOs. Um, and given the low percentage of funding that is in the GHRP for GBV, uh, we need to see funding um, being allocated bilaterally and not only through uh, pooled funding mechanisms. Um, so I'll stop there. Um, it's been a pleasure being here. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Um, so we're going to hear now from um, member states. Um, I know you're all um, colleagues in the member states delegations be keen to hear again from the panellists before the end of the meeting. In order to facilitate that, um, your interests are best served by sticking to the to the allocated time we have available. So um, please do help us with that. You will hear a beep go off if you uh, speak for longer than the um, allocated time. So if you could all please restrict yourself to two minutes, then you'll be able to hear again from the panellists. I'm really pleased to be able to start with one of the co-hosts from the Oslo conference last year, the United Arab Emirates, the permanent representative, um, Ambassador Lana Nusebe. Lana, you have the floor. Please go ahead. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, colleagues. It's so good to see so many good friends here on this fantastic panel and lineup. I'll be as brief as I can, uh, thanking the organizers and the speakers for the great um, speeches they've made today and the leadership they've shown on this issue. And of course, the UAE as co-host of last year's End SGBV conference in Oslo pushed strongly for SGBV to be at the center of the humanitarian affairs segment. We're really pleased to see such high turnout and unequivocal support today for addressing this in humanitarian contexts. Three or four quick points. Visibility and funding are going to be key to maintaining this momentum, and we'd like to highlight three levers that the UAE sees and intends to pull. First, on mainstreaming, we've been pleased to see SGBV gain standalone recognition in humanitarian response plans. We now call on humanitarian agencies to take the next step by making SGBV training and advisory services mandatory for humanitarian coordinators and country teams, as well as linking SGBV metrics to the performance evaluations of humanitarian staff. We think it's critical to match good intentions with good incentives. Second, we shouldn't always shy away from earmarking to normalize prioritization of the SGBV. We're proud to have announced 10 million US dollars in funding for a range of entities at the end SGBV conference, as well as to have earmarked 25 million US dollars for UNFPA in one of our largest ever humanitarian contributions to the UN. We heard clearly from SGBV advocates that their budgets are often the first to be slashed, and we believe donor earmarking can be an interim solution. Third, we believe in stronger reporting on SGBV in more places uh, at the UN. To see the Security Council systematically include briefings, data, and proposals on SGBV, much in the same way that we're seeing increased efforts to report on the num number of women at the peace negotiation table. This is an ideological, we think it's a practical, results-minded approach. So uh, we can't afford not to do this. Thank you again for a great turnout. Thank you very much indeed. Next, please, uh, for Japan, Ms. Yuroki Suzuki, you have the floor. Thank you, Ambassador. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Please go ahead. Thank you, Ambassador Hiloli and Mr. Markov for this uh, meeting. Well, uh, sexual and gender-based violence cannot be tolerated in any context, and Japan commits itself to work with the international community to address this issue. We need to combat this violence, although we are currently in a difficult situation with COVID-19, but I, I would uh, rather say we need to tackle this problem all the more during this pandemic. Uh, in this context, I would like to mention some projects uh, we do with UN agencies. One area is sexual violence in conflict. 
from April this year, in coordination with the special representative of the sexual uh, secretary, uh, special representative of the SG on sexual violence in conflict, we have started projects to prevent conflict-related sexual violence and violent extremism to and to address impunity in DRC, Central African Republic, and Somalia. And uh, Japan also has decided to make an additional contribution of 4.5 million US dollars to the UN women in response to the pandemic. And this includes support for victims of sexual and gender-based violence. Uh, Japan believes that uh, uh, this uh, pandemic this, uh, causes human security crisis that has a wide range of serious consequences, such as people's survival, livelihood, and dignity. So we need to uh, tackle this uh, uh, problem uh, in solidarity. And uh, in, in conclusion, and uh, I would like to uh, make uh, uh, one question, but uh, and, uh, we would like to reiterate that under the principle of human security, we will work together with yours. And uh, my question is uh, to the panelists is, uh, I think this event uh, is very uh, meaningful, given that the United Nations has many organizations, uh, not only uh, UNICEF, uh, UNFPA, UN Women, and uh, Special Representative and the uh, Office of the, the Victims' uh, rights advocate, etc. So I would like to ask how we, uh, we can uh, include uh, those agencies. How we can uh, use the knowledge of these various agencies in formulating humanitarian response plans. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please, Thailand Ambassador Srivijaya. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As we commemorate the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Platform for Action at the time of disruption caused by COVID-19, allow me to begin by recognizing the courage and contribution made by all personnel, especially women in healthcare, essential services, households, and other countless capacity during this pressing time. Challenges that have come with COVID-19 call upon us to step up our efforts to combat and prevent sexual and gender-based violence against any particular groups in humanitarian crisis. Deep in socioeconomic stress coupled with lockdown measures have intensified pre-existing gender inequality and discrimination. Reports of an increase in sexual and gender-based violence is a clear evidence that many people, especially women and girls, still live in vulnerable situations and often in silence. Thailand therefore strongly supports Secretary General's call on gender-based violence and COVID-19, as well as his policy brief on the issue. We further reiterate that special attention must be paid to pregnant women, women living with HIV and women with disabilities, as, as they are facing multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination. On our part, Thailand has stepped up measure to support women and girls amid the pandemic. We have opened eight women de development center to provide unemployed and homeless women with shelter, food, occupational training. We have also extended a debt moratorium to relieve the economic impact of COVID-19, from which over 240,000 women have benefited. With zero tolerance policy, women and girls at least can also seek support from our health line which provide assistance to victims of domestic violence and connect them with protection services and remedies. Thailand is determined to work closely with our partners around the world to further strengthen our fight to end sexual and gender-based violence in our setting. Only then can we advance progress toward achieving the 2030 agenda without leaving anyone behind. I thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Next, for the European Union, uh, Mr. Uh, Silvio Gonzato, please go ahead. Thank you, Under Secretary General, and uh, congrats for uh, displaying such an impressive array of engaged and powerful women on such a topical issue. Um, 
Uh, as many of you have already indicated, the current epidemic has provided yet again evidence as if we needed it. That crisis exas exacerbates structural gender inequalities. And we've seen reports showing increased levels of gender-based violence. This is why it's so important that we continue our essential work, such as responding to, to violence. Um, we in the European Union have provided a package, the so-called Team Euro package, that equals nowadays uh, 36 billion euro, to try and help our partners around the world um, provide a robust, comprehensive response to the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly for vulnerable populations outside the EU. Um, we've also working, uh, we're also working on trying to adapt EU-funded humanitarian actions to factor in the COVID-19 pandemic. But at the same time, we want to ensure that the delivery of life-saving humanitarian assistance continues, including the prevention and response to gender-based violence. So we don't want to be distracted by this, uh, by the COVID pandemic uh, in this respect. And in, in 2019, just to give you an illustration of our commitment, we allocated approximately 26 million euros of our humanitarian aid budget, specifically to prevent and respond to gender-based violence worldwide. We're also part of the uh, global initiative call to action on protection from gender-based violence in emergencies, and we're very active there, and we look forward to the new roadmap that will aim at ensuring an effective humanitarian response to the uh, plague of gender-based violence. Our work on gender, -based, on gender and gender-based violence and humanitarian aid is long from being finished. Risk mitigation needs to become a reflex for all humanitarian workers, and we need to continue advocating for better responses to GBV from the start of any crisis. So my question is, what can we do more and better to ensure that gender mainstreaming and gender-based violence, violence risk mitigation becomes part of the DNA of humanitarian workers, and how do we foster this shift in attitude? Thank you very much, Mr. Lossi. Thank you. Next, please, Germany. Ms. Karen Goebel, please. Go ahead. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, I would like to uh, thank the Chair, Ambassador Hilal, and all of our panelists for making this issue a priority of the ECOSOC has. I think the testimonies we have heard today were a stark illustration why we really need to better address this pre uh, pressing issue in the current situation, but also in general. We fully agree with what has been said. It is high time that we apply the lessons learned and the commitments made since Beijing 25 years ago, and also since uh, Resolution 3025 was adapted two decades ago, and uh, since the call uh, to action on protection from gender-based violence and emergencies uh, and the Oslo Conference last year. Germany is fully committed to this goal, for example, by applying a dedicated gender age disability marker on all funding applications we receive, or by leading the negotiations to Security Council Resolution 2467, a follow-up resolution to 1325 during Germany's Security uh, Council presidency last April. In the framework of our humanitarian assistance, we are supporting SGBV-related measures and initiatives. As donors and actors in this unprecedented crisis, we are now more than ever obliged to make sure the humanitarian response we are supporting is set up to be conscious of and includes measures to counter sexual and gender-based violence. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please, Canada, um, Deputy Permanent Representative Richard Arbeiter. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Gillian Gillen in place of Richard. Um, I'd like to thank many of the panelists for the references to the call to action um, from gender-based violence and emergencies. And Canada, as the lead of this, shares, of course, our deep concern about the increasing rate of gender-based violence uh, as a result and during this pandemic. We must hold each other accountable to affected populations to deliver gender responsive humanitarian programming. This is necessary to meet the differentiated needs of um, vulnerable populations. It is not the responsibility of a single organization to prevent and mitigate uh, gender-based violence, but for all, all humanitarian actors. And so we invite those and 
so many of you are members of the call to action, but for those who may not be familiar with the joint statement that Canada issued um, on gender-based violence and COVID-19 on behalf of the 85 call to action that partners, the statement outlines what we will need to do to place the safety of women and girls at the center of the COVID-19 response. Canada welcomes and encourages collective action as has been discussed today. And we have the same question that others have raised and which I thank Eleanor and Fatima for speaking to on the panel about how we can further support humanitarian actors, including women's rights organizations through partnership to ensure that gender-based violence services are recognized as life-saving and essential throughout the COVID-19 response. Thank you. Thank you, Gillian. Next, please, uh, Ambassador Martin Herman for Denmark. Martin, go ahead. Oh, thank, you. thank you, Mark, and thank you to you and, and Omar, uh, and I think all the panelists. Um, and, and then I want to express my deep gratitude uh, and admiration uh, to all the staff in the field who are literally saving lives uh, every day. Now, I have three points to make. First of all, we are extremely worried about reports that, that restrictive measures designed to limit the spread of COVID-19 around the world, in fact, increases uh, the risk of domestic violence, including intimate partner violence, as Natalia said earlier. And this is the reality, I think, in both developing uh, and developed countries, including mine. Now, as health and social protection, as well as legal systems that protect women and girls are weakened under pressure of COVID-19, there will be a higher need of assistance in preventing violence against uh, women and girls. Now, I think in emergency response, it's absolutely crucial that all women and girls continue to be protected from gender-based violence. And as a consequence of the pandemic that could actually disproportionately affect <clears throat> women, it is particularly important that protection from gender-based violence is given the needed attention in the global humanitarian response to COVID-19. Now, in the global humanitarian response, we need to ensure that sexual and reproductive health needs of women and girls, including uh, psychosocial support services, continues to be prioritized. This is to ensure, quite simply, continuity and avoid a rise in maternal and newborn mortality, and in, avoid a rise in increased unmet need for contraception, and of course, an increased number of unsafe abortions and sexually transmitted infections. Now, more restrictive uh, access to proper health services, contraception, family planning, and safe abortion. Uh, will actually make life even more unsafe for women and girls. And we must ensure that the health crisis does not turn into a protection crisis. Now, finally, ensuring life-saving assistance and protecting the most vulnerable in this global crisis requires strong, multilateral, and rules-based coordination. And we would like to sincerely thank the UN organizations, including your organization, Mark Ocha, for their prompt and coordinated response in addressing the most urgent humanitarian needs through the Global Humanitarian Response Plan, which we have supported from Denmark's side. Now, it must be is a response plan founded in humanitarian of humanity, neutrality, impartiality, and independence, as well as in the relevant humanitarian response, emphasizing that everyone, including women and girls, must have access to all essential life-saving humanitarian assistance and health services. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Next, please, for Guatemala, Ambassador Luis Land, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair, for giving me the floor and convening this important high-level event. Guatemala recognizes the relevance of the topic, especially at the time when the COVID-19 pandemic has directly affected on the lives of women, adolescents, and girls. People in conditions of vulnerability of exclusion, as well as indigenous people, older persons, and persons living with disabilities. Mindful that in many countries, the level of violence against women has increased during the COVID-19 crisis, we stress that this must be addressed urgently. We are very concerned that for many women and girls, the threat of violence is highest now, precisely when they should be in the safest condition in their own homes, taking into account that containment and quarantine are essential to reduce the spread of the virus. Women play an essential role in the fight against COVID-19 pandemic. In Latin America, 74% of people employed in the health and social sectors are women. Despite this, while being the main providers of these basic services, they are often excluded from leadership and decision-making roles in this sector. Gender discrimination continues to be an obstacle to the full individual development of women, and it is also an impediment to achieve the goals of Agenda 2030 for uh, development, in particular SDG 5 and 8, 
The government of Guatemala, led by Ale the President Alejandro Yamate, has made a strong call and is working tirelessly with several government institutions to put an end on this scourge. The three branches of the state are taking measures and coordinating efforts to ensure the incorporation of women's needs in the emergency response. A hotline has been put in place to report incidents to the police, and we have redoubled efforts to have public officers adequately trained at the local level. We express our appreciation for the work done by UN Women in Guatemala, which is now in the process of compiling data on the effects of the COVID-19 emergency on women. We value UN Women as a strategic partner in the various efforts and work of women's empowerment in many countries. To conclude, it is in inevitable to ask myself one question. How can we prevent violence against women? Well, by empowering women in every way throughout their life. I thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Next, please, the representative of Afghanistan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At the outset, at the outset, please allow me to extend my warmest thanks to all our distinguished panelists for their important words today. Mr. Chairman, in Afghanistan, COVID-19 is occurring on top of a protracted conflict that has resulted in an increasingly dire humanitarian situation. Women and girls are facing reduced access to critical services, not only in healthcare, but for gender-based violence assistance. But Afghanistan is responding. The laws enshrined in our constitution provide a legal basis for the empowerment and protection of women who suffer from violence. Community workers throughout the country continue to conduct outreach to women and girls, even when reporting mechanisms have been limited, have been limited due to the pandemic. We are working closely with various UN agencies to ensure that we continue to raise awareness of GBV resources throughout the country. A new hotline has been set up to connect women with disabilities to various resources, and the government is working to enlist the support, the support at provincial level to disseminate further GBV information and information about resources. On the global level, it's imperative that we utilize all avenues, including mobile services and remote assistance, to ensure the safety and security of women and girls everywhere. We must not divert critical resources away from GBV programs and those that assist survivors of violence. I thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, now, I believe we have the ambassador for Egypt with us. Um, Excellency, if you're there, please take the floor now. Okay, we'll move on. Next, for the United States, um, Elizabeth Bailey at the US State Department. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. Um, and thanks for everybody. Uh, thanks to everybody uh, for the opportunity to comment. Um, the United States remains committed to preventing and responding to gender-based violence, emphasizing the protection and empowerment of women and girls as a life-saving priority and as an integral part of every humanitarian response. As was made clear by the panelists, this is particularly important in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has further exacerbated the risks facing women and girls in humanitarian crises. So much has been done to further our goal to protect and uphold the rights of women and girls, significant gaps remain. The provision of adequate resources to meet basic needs is essential, as is ensuring national systems respond to the needs of all survivors and those at risk of gender-based violence, particularly with respect to health and ensuring access to justice and ending human impunity. The United States also remains committed to safe from the start and to our involvement with the call to action on, on protection from gender-based violence in emergencies. Through safe from the start, the United States has channeled more than $179 million to systematically prevent and respond to gender-based violence at the onset of emergencies and has contributed significant additional funding to core and specialized gender-based violence responses through other mechanisms. The barriers to the empowerment and meaningful participation of women and girls in society need to be addressed. 
requiring investment in education and access to safe livelihoods, which are critical to increase, increasing resilience and supporting eventual solutions. Involvement of women and girls in decision-making and program design is key, as is consulting and collaborating with communities in identifying and mitigating risks. We feel these are all areas where we can make a difference if we all prioritize prevention and response to gender-based violence and emergencies, and we have highlighted this necessity in our own women, peace, and security strategy. We appreciate and support ongoing partnerships to address this problem, including the role of the UN Special Representative on Sexual Violence and Conflict, and remain fully committed to UN Security Council Resolutions 1820 and 1888, and to providing justice for the most vulnerable. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next, please, to United Kingdom, Tom Woodruff. Please go ahead. Thanks, Mark, uh, and thank you to all the panelists for a truly excellent discussion this afternoon. Um, Mark, I think we've learned many awful things over the last few months as a result of the COVID crisis, but perhaps one of the most awful is the realization that it has taken a global health pandemic to drive home. And I think for many of us really to understand properly what civil society and you and colleagues have been warning us all for years. And that is just how unsafe many homes are for women and girls worldwide. And of course, the UK is deeply concerned about the significant gender impacts of this crisis and the surge in violence against women and girls. Galvanizing action and ensuring accountability across the international community to prevent and respond to this violence has never mattered more. As Natalia described it earlier, it's a global emergency. So I can assure you that the UK's commitment to this agenda is unwavering. We recently provided 10 million pounds in funding to support UNFPA to address the needs of women and girls impacted by COVID-19, including maintaining access to gender-based violence support services and critical sexual and reproductive health services. And we will continue to push for these issues to be central to the COVID-19 Global Humanitarian Response Plan, including by continuing to encourage the addition of a specific objective on GBV, the importance of which this discussion today has highlighted. And of course, we also join with those calling for women, including survivors, to be front and center of COVID response efforts. Finally, in the face of significant upheaval, the UN must continue to ensure that its programs, actions, and behaviors remain grounded in respect for human rights, gender equality, and the responsibility to do no harm. And this, of course, includes upholding commitments and international standards to prevent and address sexual exploitation and abuse in the delivery of international assistance, and ensuring that staff are protected from abuse of authority and harassment in the internal handling of the response. And we urge timely communication during the pandemic on emerging SEAH risks, hotspots, and action taken to address issues of concern, including support to survivors. Thank you very much. Thank you. And lastly, please, for Ireland, Susan Fraser. Thank you, Mark. Thanks very much. Um, I'd just like to start by um, thanking the, the panel. I think they were particularly powerful contributions and it really brought the issues into stark reality. I think it gave us a really deep understanding of the issues, um, particularly at country level. I think gender-based violence, um, it's an issue very close to, to our heart in Ireland. Um, it's a key pillar of our own develop, international development programme. I think one thing I'd like to echo is um, the comment about the need for dedicated funding. Ireland is deeply committed to any earmarked core funding, but this is one area where we do have a dedicated budget line because we realise that really is the importance of addressing gender-based violence in emergency really requires a, an, an additional focus. I think what we heard today was particularly encouraging. I mean, despite the many, many challenges, I think it's really important to not acknowledge the fantastic work that's been done on the ground. And we heard from many, from civil society, from UN agencies, some really particularly innovative work that is taking place in, in, as part of the COVID response. So while the COVID response really has brought us huge challenges, I think it's also um, presenting us with huge opportunities for ad advancing work on gender-based violence. And my comment would really be it's a comment and a question in terms of how can we ensure that our response to COVID is not just about scaling up our gender-based violence programming, but also about bringing about the really transformative change that we've heard about today, issues of 
and accountability, participation, localisation. So how can we make sure that our response to COVID makes those changes happen and also ensures that they are sustainable over the longer term? Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Um, so um, we've rather overrun the uh, allocated time for the meeting, which I apologise, colleagues, but I would like to give the panellists um, a chance each to say, to make one final point in less than 60 seconds each, panellists, please, if you if you could manage that. Uh, Minister Sreda Eriksson and Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie have had to leave us, unfortunately, uh, but our other six panellists are still with us. So, um, Eleanor, can I please start with you? One point, less than 60 seconds, please. Um, thank you. Uh, that's, uh, that's rather a lot of pressure. Um, I think, I mean, I think I, I'm going to have to repeat the, the point about funding. I, I, I do want to acknowledge there's been progress, but it is still, um, it's, it's, there isn't enough earmarked funding. The, the tracking mechanism so that we can then monitor how much money actually goes to these services on the ground is lacking. Um, and I just want to repeat the plea for um, bilateral funding um, uh, from governments to NGOs, particularly local NGOs, where possible um, uh, for these uh, for these really important services to continue and expand. Thanks. Thank you. Christine, please. Uh, ICRC South Sudan. Sure, thank you. The ICRC also would like to echo the comments that were made earlier as well. The, the importance of having funding that specifically is put aside to be able to make sure that this conversation, this topic and this work moves forward is, is especially critical and uh, also very much supported by the ICRC. Thank you, Christine. Um, Patty Mark in Nigeria, can we come to you next, please? Thank you very much. Um, I would like to emphasize on commitment, as I earlier stated, um, taking the example of call to action on GBV as an example of how local leadership and um, commitment from national government and international donors can actually help in the fight against GBV. And then also, also to say that sadly, increased attention to GBV through high level events does not translate to funding to those who matter most. That is the grassroots um, organization. So it is important for us to prioritize funding on GBV to women led organizations at the grassroots level. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Kelly Clements, UNHCR, can we come to you next? Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, IRC and ICRC took one of my points. So let me give you another one, which is prioritizing uh, prevention in response to GBV and sexual exploitation and abuse as part of the COVID-19 response, how important that is, it needs to be functional, needs to be actionable, and we need to find alternative ways that we can work during the pandemic in, in order to ensure that the, the incidents don't increase. Also mainstreamed within health sector responses, critically important. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kelly. And Henrietta, next, please. Um, thank you, Mark. Um, so I would have said funding, uh, then I would have gone to Kelly's point, but as the third one, maybe I choose um, that it's extremely important to do the measurements, to have a target and to meet it. Uh, shaming, uh, experiences and countries and communities can make a difference. So measurements. Thank you. Thank you, Henrietta, very much indeed. And Natalia, please. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to thank the member states. This has been extremely encouraging for all of us. And I think you've posed some very astute questions, which uh, Mark and uh, Ambassador Omar, I think, may need another session in, in the future to really delve into. But very briefly, uh, COVID, and um, as Henrietta mentioned, other momentous world events are showing us the uh, impact of when any, every type of discrimination where women and girls tend to bear the brunt. So as we rally uh, in the Secretary General's words to build back better and not go back to the old normal, 
I would like to just emphasize that we need to disaggregate data in order to know who's being left behind. We've got to be able to count them. We've got to be able to show where they are and we have to plan carefully together so that we can meet the need. And among these needs, as many echoed, is the psychosocial dignity factor that allows a woman or a girl to get over the trauma and to repair her life and to uh, not be isolated by shame and stigma. So uh, the, the words of our writer in terms of the language that we need. So every 10 year old girl understands her inherent beautiful dignity and human rights is going to be important. I think we could do more with testing like telecounseling, um, telemedicine type uh, support systems. And certainly I have to echo the call that local actors make a difference. So we need to share, we need to share the budgets and we need to share the decision-making with the people that are going to make this happen. A, a good thing about any emergency is that people rise to the occasion. We want to work together to get over this. And the fact that it's been a chronic emergency, I think is very much in front of us now. So let us work in concert, let us keep moving quickly and let's end this. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. Um, two final comments from me. Um, firstly, all those of you who called for more activity on um, women's empowerment, gender equality, um, gender-based violence in the COVID context, please can I again draw your attention to the fact that there are something like $125 million worth of proposals in our updated Global Humanitarian Response Plan, which are sitting there available to you to finance. Um, so, you know, the, the agencies are keen to do this work and have developed fantastic proposals. Please, those on the financing side of the table, feel free to finance those proposals. And secondly, uh, Zina um, Schrader Erickson and I both mentioned again at the beginning of the meeting, we are still tracking all those hundreds of commitments made in Oslo, and we will be reporting in September who has done what of what they promised to do. Um, um, so, Omar, I, I pass back to you now, I think. I should just say, I've just this instant been told that um, the delegation from China would also like to take the floor, um, which has just come to my attention. So maybe, Omar, I should give the, the, the word to the delegation from China, and then, then you will take over straight away um, the chair and close the meeting. Thank you very much, my dear group and friend and uh, really good partner in uh, uh, the house. I would like to thank our distinguished panelists and our moderator, my dear friend Mark, as well as all delegation for a rich discussion today. I especially want to thank all our distinguished panelists for sharing their perspectives and experience. Allow me to make some concluded remarks as a reflection. First, the discussion touched upon how humanitarian crisis deepened the risk of gender-based violence for women and girls, especially when family and community protection have broken down. Two, we have heard about the various threats that women and girls are exposed to, and COVID-19 has certainly amplified this. We have heard of reports of domestic violence on the rise all over the world and their quarantine, including in humanitarian settings. Three, I was particularly happy to hear of all the good practices put in place to advance gender equality and prevent sexual and gender-based violence. Of particular interest, the need to include women voices and women civil society. Here I want to amplify Fatima's message to all of us to strengthen our engagement with civil society, civil society, civil society. They are, they are an essential part of the solution. Sinasi, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to remind participants that virtual side events on saving lives, building trust, and informing humanitarian action, how good practice and lessons learned from community engaged can help with COVID-19 will take place tomorrow, 11 June, from 8 to 9.30. The second informal meeting of the 
2020 humanitarian affairs segment will be held tomorrow, Wednesday, 10 June at 10 a.m. to hold a high level panel discussion focusing on, on improving humanitarian effectiveness through new technology and innovation opportunities and challenges. A high level event convened on the ma margin of 2020 economic and social concert humanitarian affairs segment is now concluded. I thank you for your participation, your contribution, your presence, and especially for your commitments. All the ladies who are with us today. Thank you. Before so you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye, Henrietta. Thank you. Bye-bye, Fatima. Okay. Bye-bye, Geneva. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you, Mark. <laughs>